Hi, this is Matt at LSAT Lab, and today's lesson is on stacked ordering games in the logic game section. So stacked ordering games are fairly common. 17% of all logic games are stacked ordering games. It's an important game type because of their frequency, um, but it's also an important game type because it's where you can start to separate yourself from the other test takers. Those who have not prepared, um, stacked ordering games are one that's relatively easy to improve on, but are hugely important as you're trying to move through the 150s and into the 160s. Our process on stacked ordering games is the same as it is for all the other game types, right? So these, these are more like the phases that you're going to go through during the course of any game, right? First, you're going to get a good game board. Then you're going to notate the rules. Then you're going to go look for inferences. And then, and only then, are you going to go look at the questions. But you want to make sure that you're kind of thinking about each one of these phases in a distinct way. Right? The game board is where you're going to create the organization of how you're going to track your hypotheticals. That's primarily going to come from the scenario, the paragraph before the rules. Occasionally, it's left unclear within the scenario, and you do need some of the rules in order to clearly establish what kind of game or what kind of organization would be most helpful. Right, for stacked ordering games, the game board that we're going to use is the number line that we use for standard ordering games, but we're going to add additional rows to it in order to be able to track additional pieces of information. So let's take a look at an example. I'd like you to hit pause and Try to come up with a game board that you feel like you could use in order to track the information, in order to create a hypothetical. So if you wanted to create a valid hypothetical for this game, what would be a game board that you could create that would allow you to track that information? Hit play again when you think you have something. All right, welcome back. So what we're being asked to do is to take a six-week literature course and plan which six books are going to be or, um, discussed in what order. Right, so we've got F, K, N, O, R, and T to be discussed. And we need to figure out the order. Right? The books will be discussed one at a time, one book per week. So one book per week, one at a time. This is one-to-one -one ordering. And we can create a game board that looks something like this, where we've got six spots for the six players or for the six books. Then it goes on to say, in addition, written summaries will be required for one or more of the books. So some of them are going to, um, we're going to have a summary of them. The order in which the books are discussed and the selection of books to be summarized is subject to the following conditions. Now, in the end of this scenario, the, the game does something a little bit misleading with the language. It uses the word selection, right? and that word selection is often associated with in-out grouping games. And so I could imagine someone looking at this game and starting to think, well, this feels like in-out and also ordering. But one way of thinking about the um, summaries is either they're going to be summarized or they're not going to be summarized. And so we can take the six books, put them in order, and then figure out yes or no on whether they're going to be summarized. And so we could create a second row, one for summary and one for no summary. So after you have a game board set up, then you want to turn to the rules. And, and the rules are a place where you want to make sure that you go slowly. Be careful as you're setting up the rules because this is a really common place for people to make mistakes. Take a minute, hit pause, see if you can diagram these rules in a way that has a consistent notation. We're going to put that next to the game board. And when you're ready to look at how I set them up, go ahead and hit play again. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at the uh, rules one at a time and set up a, a notational structure that help, helps us understand those rules at a glance. So the first rule tells us that no two books that are summarized are discussed in consecutive weeks. So in that second row, or the bottom row, we cannot have two S's consecutively. We can just put them in an anti-block, right? and that'll help us remember no S's consecutively. The second rule tells us if N is not summarized, then both R and T are summarized. So this is an if-then rule, a conditional rule. We want to set this up as an if-then statement. On the left side of the arrow, we'll have N is not summarized, and on the right side of the arrow, we'll have both R and T summarized. So we can set this up with N not summarized, and we can use a slash for, to represent the idea that N is not summarized on the left, and then uh, we'll put subscripts S um, on both R and T in the necessary condition. So if N is not summarized, then R and T are summarized. If you like to take the contrapositive, by all means, if R or T is not summarized, then N is summarized. The third rule tells us that if N is discussed or N is discussed earlier than T and T is discussed earlier than O, so that is a, a relative string where N is preceding T is preceding O. We can just set them up in a, in a partial uh, tree. The fourth rule tells us F is discussed earlier than O and O is discussed earlier than both K and R. 
right? So this is basically fleshing out the rest of our tree. All six players are now contained within this tree. So like I said, a really good place to look for inferences is in trees, where you're thinking about who can go first, who can go last, who is the most limited. Usually it's that last question, who's the most limited, that tends to be helpful when you're looking at stacked ordering games. And that's true here as well. So if we think about who can go first, N or F could go first. If we think about who could go last, K or R could go last. But if we think about who's the most limited, O has a relationship to the, to the five other players, whereas no other book has a relationship to everyone else. So K has a relationship to O and has a relationship to F and has a relationship to T and has a relationship to N, but it does, K does not have a relationship to R in terms of which one precedes the other. We know that K comes after O, it comes after T, it comes after F, it comes after N, but we don't know whether it comes after or before R. And so if we're looking for the most um, limited player or constrained player, that will help us find the opportunity for frames because we'll be able to say, okay, either this player has to go here or has to go there. In this case, we get an even better situation. There's only one week in which O could go, which is the fourth week. And so there's probably an important inference to make. We might be able to go a little bit further. Like, for example, we could say, well, we don't exactly know where K and R are going to go, but we do know that they're going to both be behind O. And so we could drop them into positions five and six and just do like a split option in order to help us remember that it's either K and five and R and six or vice versa. And then if we look at positions one, two, and three, we know that they're going to have to be filled with N, T, and F, and that we have a relationship between N and T, that N precedes T. So in that one, two, three zone, we'll have F, and we'll have N and T with N preceding T. F can go anywhere. N could go in either one or two. T could go in either two or three. Once you've made all the inferences, then it's time to move on, move on to the questions. Now, have we made all the inferences? I'm sure there's other things that we could say that are true, but I don't think there's anything else that we know for sure in terms of locking in a particular player to any one spot. So now let's go look at the questions. Here's the first question. Hit pause. See if you can find the right answer. When you have one, hit play again, and we'll work it through together. All right, welcome back. So what we want to do, this is a rules question. Right? The first question of the set is typically what we call a rules question where we can just take the rules and apply them one at a time, knock out the wrong answer choices, and uh, choose the last remaining choice. So essentially, we've got four rules. We've got four wrong answers. It doesn't always work out that it's always going to be one-to-one, -one, but it's usually one-to-one. -one. We're just going to work our way through those rules. The first rule tells us that we can't have any two books summarized consecutively, and so we look for where two books that are summarized would be consecutive. And what we're kind of doing is we're looking at the, 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 in that list where we've got T and R summarized in A and N and K summarized in B. And so if T and R are going to be summarized in A, that means that T and R can't be consecutive in the earlier listed order of the books. Now, T and R are not consecutive in answer choice A, and so A doesn't break the first rule. If we were to go look at answer choice B, N and K, are N and K consecutive in the list of six? No, it goes N O K. So then we look at C T O R. If T O R are all summarized, then no combination of them can be consecutive. But I see T and O consecutive um, in the third and fourth positions in answer choice C. So that's going to break the first rule. So let's keep checking. Rather than moving on to the next rule, it's a good idea to finish off the choices because if it turns out that an earlier rule knocks out two answer choices instead of one, and one of the rules doesn't knock out any answer choices, I'd rather not get to the end of the list of rules and realize that I need to go back and knock out another answer choice. I won't know which rule to turn to, so I have to go through the rules all over again. So I'd rather just knock out D and E, or at least look at them and consider them before moving on to the next rule. T and O, if T and O are consecutive, they are not consecutive in D. And in E, T and R, T and R are not consecutive in E. So the first rule breaks answer choice C. So now we turn to the second rule, and we're looking for if N is not summarized, then R is summarized and T is summarized. One way in which you could look at this is that there is a negative to positive relationship between N and R being summarized and N and T being summarized. So at least one of N and R need to be summarized, and at least one of N and T need to be summarized. So if N is summarized, 
then R and T can do whatever they want. We already have the one. If N is not summarized, then R and T both need to be. Right? So we could look at the ones that are listed as those that are being summarized and say, okay, well, in every one of those combinations, we need to see at least one of N and R. Does A have at least one of N and R being summarized? Yes. Um, it has actually both R and T. Um, so that's perfectly fine. In answer choice B, N is summarized, so the rule doesn't apply. In answer choice D, N is not summarized, so it needs to have R and T, but it doesn't. So answer choice D breaks the second rule. Looking at answer choice E, N is not summarized, but R and T are summarized, so that satisfies the rule. Answer choice E is perfectly fine. The next rule, we could look at the rules individually, N, T, O, or we could look at F before O before K and R, or we could just go grab the longest string we can find. Oftentimes when we have trees, what we just want to do is convert and find the longest tree we can find. So we know it needs to go N and then T and then O before the K and the R. And so we can look at A. Do we have N before T before O before K and R? Yes, we do. So that's okay. If we look at answer choice B, do we have N before T before O? No, we don't. We can get rid of answer choice B. So then the last piece that we need to test is that F is before O. Right? And if we look at A, F is before O, so that's perfectly fine. If we look at E, F is not before O. O is before F. Let's get rid of E. And that leaves answer choice A as the right answer. Here's the second question in the set. Go ahead and give this one a try. And when you think you've got an answer, go ahead and play again, and we'll work it through together. All right, welcome back. So this one is a local question. It's telling us, it's giving us this new piece of information. Right? It's giving us this N is the second book discussed. Right? So if we know that N is the second book discussed, right, we can pop it into the game board. And if we know that it is not summarized, we can just rule out um, summarized, or slash out the second spot in the bottom row. And then what we want to do is make as many inferences as we possibly can before looking at the answer choices. Right? This question is asking for what could be true. And that means that the right answer isn't necessarily something that we're going to figure out. It could be something that sits around the inferences that we make. But we want to see if we can make any, as many inferences as possible. It's a good idea to run with a local piece of information, that new piece of information in the question stem, before you look at the answer choices. So if n is second and it's not summarized, what do we know? Well, we know that n is before t, so t is going to have to go third. And that means that f is going to have to go first with k and r 5 and 6. Anything else? Well, since n is not summarized, that second rule applies. Right? So if n is not summarized, then r and t are both summarized. Now, we know where t is. t is the third one. But we don't know whether r is going to go fifth or sixth. It could go either way. r could go into five, and k can go into six, or vice versa. Either, no matter where we put r, it'll have to be summarized. So what else can we infer? We can figure out that, like for example, o, which is going in the fourth week, because t is summarized in the third week, can't have two consecutive summarized books, o can't be summarized. If we go to look at k, no matter whether we put k in 6 or pick, put k in 5, it'll be next to r, which is, has a summary, and we can't have two summaries in, in, in a row. So we, we actually know that k is not going to have a summary as well. The only thing we don't know is f and whether it's going to get a summary or not get a summary. Right? So that's going to be typically the thing that could be true, the thing that you haven't figured out. Right? All the things that you figure out are the things that um, knock out the wrong answer choices. And the thing that fits within whatever you figured out, that ends up being the right answer, typically. So in this case, it turns out F is summarized is possible, answer choice A. If we look at the other wrong ones though, K is summarized, no, we know that K is not summarized. O is summarized, no, we know that it's not summarized. T is discussed earlier than F, we know that um, F is first and T is third, so no, we know the opposite. And then answer choice E says that the third book discussed is not summarized, we know that the third book is T and it is summarized, we can knock out answer choice E leaves us with answer choice A is the right answer. Okay, here's the next question. Hit play as soon as you think you have the answer. All right, welcome back. So if O is summarized, what do we know? Well, we know that O is in the fourth week, so we can put S into the bottom row for week four. And since we know that we can't have any two summarized books consecutively, we know that weeks three and five are not going to be summarized. But there's not a lot else that we can figure out here. So... What we can do is go to the answer choice A, plug it in and see if it could be true, if it could be true, because right? they're asking for what cannot be true. In order for us to figure out whether something cannot be true, 
we can either test a, an, essentially an infinite number of places in which it's not going to be the case, or we can just test the opposite and see if we can come up with a counterexample and use that to eliminate A if possible. So if we can find a way in which it could be the case that F is the first book discussed, then we can knock out A. As we go through each of these choices, I would expect that we will test A. If we can create a counterexample, we'll knock it out and go to the next one. We'll create a counterexample, knock it out, go to the next one. Eventually, we'll get to one that we can't create a counterexample to, and then we'll have to pick it. So could it be the case that F is the first book discussed? Well, let's see if F could be the first book discussed. If we put F in the first week, right, then what's going to happen? Well, we know that N and T are going to go into weeks two and three because N has to go before T, and those are the only two spots left. Anything else we know? Since T is not summarized, then we know that by contrapositive of that second rule, N has to be summarized in the second week. But this is possible. This is a valid hypothetical. So this eliminates answer choice A. It could be the case that F is um, the first book discussed. Let's get rid of it. And now we can use this hypothetical before we go get rid of anything. Uh, we can look at these other answer choices. If any of them are possible inside of our, our hypothetical here, then we can eliminate them as well. So let's look at answer choice B. K is the sixth book discussed, right? That's definitely possible within our hypothetical here. We could put K sixth. So let's eliminate answer choice B. F is summarized. We don't have that here, so let's hold on to C. D says that K is not summarized. That looks possible. I mean, we know that the book in week five is not summarized, and K could go into week five, so get rid of D. And then E, N is not summarized. Well, we have N summarized. So we don't have this. So we're basically down to C and E from the hypothetical that we used or created for answer choice A. Like, take the, get as much mileage as you can from each of your hypotheticals. If you create one in order to test A, before you go create one to test B, see if that one would apply to any of the other answer choices. So now let's go see if we can make F summarized. If we put F in week two, right? We had F in week one in the last hypothetical. Let's put F in week two so we can make it summarized. That means that N and T are going to be in weeks one and three respectively, and that week one is not going to be summarized because we can't have any two consecutive weeks. We can't have their books being summarized. So what does this mean? If we check this against the rules, we don't have any summarized weeks consecutively. If N is not summarized, which it's not, then R and T are supposed to be summarized. R could be summarized, but it looks like T is not summarized. So actually, this doesn't satisfy the rules. In trying to create a way in which F was summarized, we tried it and we had F in one in the previous one. We just tried it in two. It doesn't look like we can get F to be summarized. We can't put it into three because that wouldn't be summarized. Um, this might be the answer. So let's hold on to it for a second. So if we want to go look at answer choice E, we should see that it's possible that N is not summarized. If N is not summarized, that means that the second rule applies. If N is not summarized, then R and T are definitely summarized. And R would have to be summarized in week six since it can't be summarized in week five. Are we going to six? If T is going to be summarized, it can't be summarized in week three. It could be summarized in week two, but it couldn't go in one because N has to go in front of it. So T would have to go into two. Right? And it would be summarized, which means N would go into one because N has to go before it. So N would go into one, but it would not be summarized because you can't have two summarized books consecutively. F would have to go into week three. And there we go. So here's a valid hypothetical, which shows that it could be the case that N is not summarized. We can knock out answer choice E, and that leaves us with answer choice C is the right answer. Here's the next question in the set. Go ahead and give this a try, and when you think you've got an answer, hit play again. All right, welcome back. So if neither of the last two books discussed is summarized, which one of the following could be true? So what do we know? If the, if the last two books are not summarized, we can slash those out which means that R is for sure not summarized because R has to go into either week five or six. Since R is in five or six and it's not going to be summarized, that means that by the contrapositive of the second rule, that N has to have a summary. And so we can add that either to the game board or to the tree in order to be able to track that information if we're afraid of losing it. If we don't know where to put it into the game board, just add it to the tree. Take the inferences as far as you can go, but then when you run out of inferences you can make, compare what you found against the answer choices. Right? So we're looking for what's possible. Is it possible that K is summarized? Well, according to the information that we have, no. K is either five or six, and it's definitely not going to be summarized, so we can get rid of A. B says O is summarized. I don't know if we know anything about that, so leave it. C says that R is summarized. We know that R is definitely not summarized, so we can get rid of C. D says that F and T are summarized. Well, we don't know about F. It doesn't look like we know about T, so leave it. E, N is not summarized. Well, we know N is summarized. We can get rid of E. 
right? So we were actually able to get rid of quite a few. We haven't gotten all the way to the right answer though yet. So O is summarized, F and T are summarized. So it looks like O could be summarized. I don't see any reason why it couldn't be. D is a stronger answer choice. It's more likely that D is going to get itself into trouble than that B will get itself into trouble. Right? What's, one, what's easier to occur? To say that O is summarized or to say that F and T are summarized? It's, it's going to be easier to say that one is summarized than to say that two are summarized. And so I might just start by testing D. I would expect it to um, run into a problem. We can then eliminate it and then choose B. So if F and T are summarized, we could add that to our tree down below. And then we would know that the first three are all going to be summarized. But we can't have consecutive books being summarized. So that's not going to work. That gets rid of D. And that's how we know that B is the right answer. If we wanted to test it, we could plug it in. Um, if we make O uh, a summarized book, we could just find a way in which we can get F, N, and T into uh, the hypothetical. Drop them in F, N, and T. Right? Make N a summarized book. F and T, well, they can't be summarized because of where they're sitting adjacent to N and O, which are summarized books. Uh, this looks possible, and so B is our answer. So here's the last question in the set. It's a substitution question, and these are known to be particularly challenging. My recommendation is when you're trying to find the right answer, trying to find which answer choice is going to have the same impact as the original rule that it's replacing, do use a two-step process on the first pass through the answer choices eliminate um, any answer choice that doesn't have to be true. The right answer is something that must be the case based off of the original set of rules. So if it doesn't have to be the case, get rid of it. Then on the second pass through, the remaining choices, check to see whether the, origin, or the new rule in the answer choice, in conjunction with the rest of the rules that are still in existence, would prove the re removed rule. If it would prove the removed rule, right? so it's basically like each way needs to prove the other. If the original would prove the new, keep it. If the new would prove the original, keep it. Only one of the answer choices will satisfy both directions, and that's the right answer. Hit play again when you think you found the right answer. All right, welcome back. So let's take that two-step process and apply it. Right? So the first step is to eliminate answer choices that don't have to be true. So does it have to be true that T is discussed third and the last two books discussed are K and R, not necessarily in that order? Well, it does look like K and R are going to be the last two books, not necessarily in that order. But we don't have T being the third book discussed. That doesn't seem like it has to be true. So we can eliminate answer choice A. If we look at B, T is discussed earlier than F. And the last two books discussed are K and R, not necessarily in that order. K and R, not necessarily in that order. Last two books, that's great. T is discussed earlier than F. Does that have to be the case? Well, no, we don't have T earlier than F. Right? T and F are both earlier than O, but how they relate to each other, we don't know doesn't have to be the case. Answer choice C. K and R are among the last three books discussed. That's true. And F is among the first three books discussed. That's true as well. So keep C. That has to be true. D, K and R are discussed uh, in consecutive weeks. That's true. Not necessarily in that order. Okay. And O is discussed fourth. We also have that. Keep it. Answer choice E. K and R are discussed in consecutive weeks. That's true. Not necessarily in that order. Great. And F is discussed third. We don't have F third. In fact, we think that F could go pretty much one, two, or three. So let's get rid of answer choice E. It doesn't have to be true. And that leaves us with answer choices C and D. So we have got one more pass to take. And what we want to do this time is we want to see whether or not the new rule, so in answer choice C, K and R are among the last three books discussed, and F is among the first three books discussed. Does that prove the original that rule that we're trying to get that we're 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 eliminating, the one that puts F before O and O before K and R. Right? So if K and R are among the last three books and F is among the first three books, well, we don't really need F or any other relationship that deals with F. F knowing that F is in the first three books is fine. There's no relationship between F and N or F and T, right? So we could put F in one, two, or three, and then N and T would fall into the remaining two spaces afterward. But putting K and R into the last three places, that's not exactly what we're looking for. We were actually looking for it to go in the last two places. So this doesn't quite feel like it's giving us the same implication. So we could test this out. Or we could go to D. Let's, let's go ahead and test this out, actually. So let's plug in. Let's make sure that K and R are among the last three and that F is in the, in the first three. Does this guarantee what we had before? 
Well, we have two spots in the first group of three available and one spot in the second group of three available. So if N has to go before T, has to go before O, then N and T are going to go into that first group of three and O will go into that last group of three. But we want to know that O will go into the fourth position, that it will go before K and R. This doesn't give us uh, that, uh, that piece of information that we had originally. So C doesn't give us the original rule. If we take C and apply it to the game with the other rules, it doesn't create the necessity that F goes before O and that O goes before both K and R. Right? We will get the F before O, but we won't necessarily get the O before the K and R. So let's look at answer choice D. If K and R are discussed in consecutive weeks, not necessarily in that order, and O is discussed fourth, right? If O is discussed fourth and K and R are discussed in consecutive weeks, well, we're still going to have a N, T, O, right? So the N and T are still going to go before the O somewhere. And now we need to get the K and the R as consecutive weeks. Where are they going to go? Well, they can't go in one, two, or three because we there's not enough places left for two. The only place for that block to go would be in five and six. Right? And it's reversible, so we would end up in a similar situation that we had before. F would get forced into one, two, or three. Now that we've looked at a specific example of a stacked ordering game, let's talk about frames and how we create them. What are the triggers that tell us that frames are a good idea on stacked ordering games? Uh, so about 18% of stacked ordering games can be framed. I'm sure that some would contest that it's even higher than that. So what are we doing? We're talking about creating different worlds you know, option A or option B. If we see a fork in the road where the game can only be presented in a couple of different options, we can create essentially like these these frames or skeletons of the the two different worlds and then any missing information we can plug in as we go. But essentially we can do most of the, the setup work up front. And in stacked ordering games, the mechanism that we use in order to find those opportunities tend to be one of two things. So blocks are a really important way in which we create frames on stacked ordering games. When you're working on a, on a stacked ordering game, if you see that a block is limited to two places on the game board, it's a pretty good idea that you might want to run it out. So in this game, we've got five runners, L, N, O, P, and S will be assigned to five consecutive lanes, one through five. Five charities F, G, H, J, and K will be assigned to the five runners, one runner representing each charity. The following ordering restrictions apply. So th the scenario here is telling us what our task is. Right? Our task is to figure out who's going in which lane and to which charity are they assigned. So essentially, we need to create a, a two-row number line, one for the runners and one for the charities. We'll figure out for each lane um, which runner and which charity is going to be assigned to it. So if we look at rule one, the runner representing K is assigned to uh, lane four. We can just go ahead and put K into the fourth position in the bottom row. If we look at the second rule, Patrick is assigned to the only lane between the lanes of the runners representing F and G. So we don't know the order of F and G, but we know that P is between. Now P is on a different row than F and G, right? So we're going to have almost like a block that's reversible that cuts across both rows, something like this. P is between F and G. We just don't know the direction of that block. If you look at the next row, there are exactly two lanes between O's lane and the lane of the runner representing G. Well, we could almost imagine building this rule onto the previous rule. If there's G already placed there in this kind of big block area, we could imagine putting O there's going to be two between O and G. So to the right of G, you'd have to go one, two, three places to get to the O, but that's too many. Right? If you go F is one, P is two, G is three, and then you go two more, four and five, and then you go to O, that's six. We don't have six lanes across. So we can't put the O to the right side of the G, but we could put it to the left side. We could go G and then P to the left, and then F to the left, and then O. Right? So we can almost extend the rule a little bit and build a bigger block. Finally, the last rule tells us that S is assigned to a higher numbered lane than the lane to which N is assigned. So we would know that N will go um, before S. S is going to a higher numbered lane. So it's going to go to the right. If you're ranking, a higher ranked position is going to be a lower number. But a higher numbered position is going to be to the right. 
So now that we got the rules, we got this big block, we might think about like, where can it go? Right? Well, there's only two ways in which we can fit this block, regardless of whether of how we reverse it um, into the game board. So we could put G into the fifth position and imagine P going right above the K, or we could flip the block around, but then we would have to start with the G in the first position so that F would go third. If you started G in the second position, then F would go fourth and that would overlap with the K. And so essentially there's only two ways of doing this, right? We've got this big block. It can go in the game board two different ways and we're going to run it out both ways. Then one game board will put G into the fifth position. One game board will put G into the first position. So in the top game board, we know that we're going to go um, P, F, O. And in the bottom game, we're going to go uh, P, F, O. But we're, we're essentially just going to take the block and put it into the, to the two different options. Right? In the bottom row for the top game board, we know that J and H are, are left over. Uh, we just don't know which way they're going to go. The same is true for the bottom game board. We know that J and H are left over for the bottom row. We just don't know which order they're going to go in. In the top row, we have L, N, and S. And we have a rule about N and S. N has to precede S. So that would mean that the first position would have to be either L or N. Couldn't be an S. The last position would have to be an L or an S, but it couldn't be an N. We can do the same thing for the bottom game board. And here we go. Now we are set up with a set of frames that we can use in order to answer the questions really quickly. So when you're doing logic games this way, you are you're moving to the top of the pack. You're definitely moving through the 160s at this point. But don't think you have to frame. Not everybody likes to frame, nor should you necessarily. If you're not the type of person who thinks that framing is good for you, for example, if you find that you keep making too many mistakes and that you chase rabbit holes, you find it's actually not leading to an improvement, you could, that doesn't necessarily mean that the strategy is not good for you. You should give it a, a real solid attempt at, at learning it, but not everybody plays games the same way. There is a style to this, and you should definitely be trying to, to listen for your own personal style. Um, listen to what's working, listen to other people, try new ideas, but in the end, you have to figure out what's best for you. The other way in which we can create frames on stacked ordering games is with partial trees. And this also happens quite regularly. So look out for blocks and partial trees. These are the triggers that tell you to create frames. So here's a game. A marching band passes through exactly five towns, J, L, N, O, and P, while playing songs that feature the drummers or else the horns. It passes through each town exactly once and does not pass through any two towns at the same time. The following mu uh, must obtain. So here's the scenario. We've got a game where we need to figure out the order in which the marching band passes through these five towns and whether they're playing songs that feature the horns or the drummers as they do. So we can create a two by five game board right, for the order of the towns. And then uh, the second row, keeping track of whether or not they happen to be a D or an H. Here are the rules. If we go through them one at a time, the first rule tells us that the third town the uh, marching band passes through is Pacifica. So we can just put a P into the third position. The second rule tells us that the marching band plays a song that features drummers while passing through the second town. So in the second town, bottom row, we'll put D. The third rule tells us that the marching band plays songs that feature the horns while passing through L and O. So for L and O, we want to have an, an H below them, right? So we're basically having a block that's going to go one on top of the other. Um, we can create essentially two vertical blocks, one with L above H and one with O above H. And then next, the last rule says that the marching band passes through J at some time after it passes through L and at some time after it passes through N. Okay, so L, N, and J are in this partial tree within the stacked ordering game. And J is m the most limited of the three, right? J has two relationships, where, while L and N each have one relationship. J is limited to either the fourth or the fifth position. So if you can map out the two different places where J goes, we're going to recreate the game board and then put J into the fourth position on the top game board and then J into the fifth position on the bottom game board. And then we can kind of flesh out what happens if we put J into the fourth position. So in the top game board, if J is in the fourth position, L and N need to precede it, but L is an H. We can't put L into the second position. We'd have to put L into the first position. That way we could put H below it, which means that we're going to put N into the second position, leaving O left over for the fifth position. And there we go. O has to be an H. So the only thing we don't really know is whether the band is going to be featuring the drummers or the horns as it's passing through the third and fourth towns, which happen to be P and J respectively. In the bottom game board, when J goes to fifth, well, what do we know? Who's left? We have L, 
N and O left to place into the top row. And L and O are both H's, which means that neither of them can go into the second position. So the only one remaining that can go into the second position would have to be N. And that leaves L and O left over for positions one and four. We may not know what order they go in, but regardless of which order they go in, they're both H's. So we can get that. And so we've got a lot of information. We're ready to answer these questions really quickly at this point. Right? So partial trees can help you create frames. Blocks can help you create frames. Either way, you're looking for a fork in the road that takes the game in one direction or else another. So in summary, when you're thinking about how you spot a stacked ordering game, you're looking for words that tell you that you're on an ordering game, right? The same kind of language that you would use in order to identify a standard ordering game. The difference here is that you've got multiple variable, variable sets to keep track of, um, and you're gonna need multiple rows in order to do that. The game board that you wanna use when you're working on a stacked um, ordering game is a stacked number line. Essentially, use as many rows as you need. Typically, these will go two, maybe three, very rarely four. The types of rules that are really common to stacked ordering games relative rules, especially when they're building these partial trees, fixed rules, where they're building a fixed relationship between two players, uh, position rules, where they're either um, inserting a player into a position or ruling a player out from a particular position, and conditional rules, rules that build these if-then trigger outcome relationships such that you can apply the rule as you go, but you don't necessarily know that the rule is always supposed to apply. You create frames when you see blocks limited to two places in the game board, um, or you see a partial tree where one of the players is limited to two places as well. Right? That's going to give you the, the fork in the road in which you can then follow it and Lee see how the other rules connect onto that, that fork in the road. So that's it for today's lesson on stacked ordering games. I invite you to check out these other lessons or visit us today at lsatlab.com.